my spirit, Lord, I need restore. You know Welcome. We're glad that you're joining us again for another segment of what to expect when you visit the South Trail Church of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42, those who gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. That's an indication that the early church, the first century Christians, began to worship on a regular basis. And they followed the instruction that they were given in the manner in which they were worshiping. When you visit the South Trail Church of Christ, we preach Jesus. We're trying to get back to the Bible and we want to preach Jesus and, and Him crucified. We pray together because our connection is with God and He's the one we're seeking to please and to receive His blessings. And every Lord's Day, we partake of the Lord's Supper as a memorial to the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also, when people visit, we sing together. One of the first things that often is asked is, well, why do you sing only or sing a cappella? The word a cappella is an old Italian phrase. It means in the style of the chapel or the church. And so the church was in the habit of singing. Uh, they use this as the way of their worship. In the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 18 and 19, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning verse 15, Paul says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. These passages are instructions to sing. Why do we sing a cappella? Because number one, it's the instruction that God has given us. He's told us to do so. So we follow his instruction very simply. As we think about it, Paul uses the phrase in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, he says, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding. He said, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. It's very closely associated with what, with what Jesus said about worship in John 4, 24. Worship God in spirit and in truth. So we want to do it according to the teaching or the truth that God has given, and we want to do it with our hearts. We want to let our hearts be filled and express the, the appreciation, the worship uh, that we have for God. So since we're trying to stick to the Bible, this is the reason that we do it, because God has told us to do so. We do it in the name of the Lord, that is, by the authority of what Scripture gives us. We also sing because it's an expression of joy. In James 5.13, James writes, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. We sing because it is out of the overflow and the abundance of our heart. It's not because our individual voices are always perfect. We don't all have perfect pitch. We don't all have perfect singing quality. But we sing because it comes from the inside and allows us to express the depth of our joy. That singing also, as Paul mentions in Colossians 3, it's an expression of the grace, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so that grace resonates from our mind to our heart, our soul, and we want to express that. It also, as Paul said, it's the teaching and admonishing in all wisdom because the Word of God is, is in us. We want to then be able to express that to one another so we sing. We all sing. It's congregational singing. It's the opportunity for us to be participants in teaching and admonishing and worshiping our God. It's also an encouragement to each other because we're participating together. It's not someone performing or entertaining. It's our participation in worship. And so since worship is an individual matter, though we do it corporately or collectively, it is something then that is expressed by each individual. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, 
There the writer says, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the fruit of our lips is the opportunity for us to express our own worship, our own devotion, our commitment to God. We also sing only because that is out of respect for the silence of scriptures. Sometimes we'll use the phrase, we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. There's a lot of truth to that and there's some simple logic that because God has spoken, we wanna let God speak in our lives and be the one who gives us his instruction to do his will. We want to be pleasing to him. At times, God gives, say, generic commands, like he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. So that going is generic. Therefore, we can use all different forms or modes of transportation to go into all the world. But when God says sing, there are only two types of music in the world. There's instrumental music and there's vocal music. So God has not left it generically to say make music, but he has said specifically to sing. And so therefore we wanna respect that silence and violating the principle of that silence violates what the scriptures teach, not to add or take away from what God has given us. So we see that in scripture in Deuteronomy 4 and verse two, and even very uh, much at the end of the last book of the Bible in Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19, we are given that same principle and admonition not to add to the word of God or take away from it. So we respect the silence of scripture and allow him to do that. When we talked about the Lord's Supper, God has given us, or Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with two emblems, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. If we were going to say, take liberties and substitute, we might in modern times say, well, let's have Coke and pizza uh, instead of the unleavened bread and the, and the grape juice. That would be a violation of scripture. What if we tried to add a third element and said, well, we're gonna add peppermint candy uh, to the Lord's Supper. I'm sure that it would be appealing, especially to the children and to all of us with a sweet tooth, but it would be violating the principle of the word of God because that's not giving God what God has asked for. We also sing because that historically is what Christians have done. In fact, even in 1250, Thomas Aquinas, a very famous Catholic theologian said, we do not use instruments in church. And so what he was stating was that even there in the 13th century, more than 1200 years after the church began, that instruments were not common. In the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin and Huldrych Swingley and the Methodists, the Baptists, many of the different groups did not use instruments in their worship. It was not until really the 1800s where instrumental music all of a sudden became very prevalent uh, in practice by various denominations. So we go back to the purity of getting back to the Bible, going back to the purity of what New Testament Christianity is about. We sing because it's what God has told us to do. We sing because it's an expression of our joy. We sing because we respect the silence of scriptures and we respect the historical practice of just singing in our worship. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore.